and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. This is episode 25, a milestone episode for us. Of course, we've put out plenty of bonus content on our channel uh, during the time that we've been running, but it's important to note that this is our 25th full length episode. We're so grateful for all your continued support and to those who who tune in and subscribe from all over the world. Without you guys, this podcast will be nothing. We thank you for your participation in in our polls and, and the questions that you send in. You're all fantastic and thank you so, so much. Now, In order to celebrate reaching episode 25, I've got two fantastic guests joining me on this week's show. The first being Arsenal filmmaker James Cook, the man behind AFC Game by Game on YouTube. Make sure you check him out. He's fantastic. And most of you will recognize his voice because he's been on this show many times before. After the break, we'll be speaking to a former gunner. David Hillier joins us, fresh from uh, facing the Real Madrid legends. He'll be giving us his thoughts on Unai Emery so far. And we'll be talking a little bit about some of the uh, poor comments that we heard from AFTV regarding uh, some of the club's legends and some of the players that took part uh, on, on Saturday. So plenty to come. Make sure you stay tuned until the very, very end. Joining me on the line is our first guest this week is Arsenal fan and football documentarian. Is that the right word? It's James Cook. James, welcome back to the show, mate. How have you been? Cheers, Harry. Thanks for having me on, mate. Really, really well, thanks. Uh, Trust you're the same? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad, apart from a a mind-numbing day at the cricket today. Uh, But, you know, it was my choice. I put myself through the torture. But it's safe to say I won't be going uh, ever again. (laughs) Right, James, um, just want to get your thoughts on Unai Emery. I know it's early days still and, and a lot of people jumped on my back when I put a poll up on Twitter about this. But there is a natural break in in the football now with the international weekend. So it seems like a good time, in my opinion, to reflect on what we've seen during the past four games. Have you been impressed with Unai Emery, first of all? And if so, Why? Um, I don't know if impressed would be the word I'd use. I'm excited more than impressed at the minute. I still think there's work to be done. I think that's obvious, particularly at the back. That's when I'll be impressed if we can at some somewhere along the line this season, so out of defence and we start keeping clean sheets. But as it stands at the back, I'm still seeing the same problems that were there last season. I'm very aware that it will come with time. What I've seen at the other end of the pitch has really excited me and the pressing system, the style of play that Emery's trying to implement. With the players that have had such a long tyranny under Arsene Wenger, I think he's certainly got to uh, merit some praise for, for what he's done with these players, players like Hector Bellerin that haven't really known anything else. Um, but, it, it, you know, it's been a very positive start to the season for me. Uh, two wins on the bounce now. Um, a good win away from home at Cardiff as well. Not the most convincing, but to get that win uh, away from the Emirates is, was massive for us, given how poorly things were away from home last season. So that's that's definitely a plus in my book. Um, and we've come up against two really good teams in City and Chelsea. I know we banged on about it so much, but it was good to get those tests out the way early doors. I don't think our opposition, you know, our rivals will pick up too many points against those sides in the fixtures that we played Chelsea away from home and against the reigning champions. Of course, that's, it's going to be really tough for other teams to beat them. So I'm excited by the start. I'm feeling positive. And um, yeah, if we can sort of defence out, then I think we could have a really good season. What do you think's the issue in the defence, James? Is it the personnel? Is it the way that Emery wants to play? Or is it simply the fact that you're trying to teach a defence to play in a completely different way to the, what they've ever done before. I think it's a combination of all those things, to be honest, Harry. Uh, if you look at the, the defence as a unit, they're just so all over the place. They don't know who's meant to be pressing when. They A lot of these players aren't particularly used to playing out from the back. That's so evident with someone like Petr Cech. I don't think we bought the right sets of half in the summer. I'm not disrespecting Socrates in the slightest, but... What I think Arsenal really needed was a dominant, powering centre-half, a Virgil van dijk type of player to partner Mustafi. And I think Mustafi, he's had a very positive start to the season. I think he'd have an even better start. And his, uh, his positives in his game would be highlighted even more if he had a player that was commanding and authoritative alongside him. As it stands, though, I don't think Socrates has had a bad start to his Arsenal career at all. Um, I think he's, for, for the most part, looked very, very solid. It's just, as a unit, the two of them don't really work together. And that back four just... 
effectively it's, it's sort of like a back two most of the time because Bellerin and Monreal are pushing so high up the pitch. Um, trying trying to keep Mustafi Sochi tight to the back is is really, really tough. And then Petacek trying to play out from the back. I honestly don't think we can wait uh, much longer to see the introduction of Leno because it, it, I think as much as I want to believe Petacek could adapt to this new system, I know that he's very important to the team and he is uh, technically our captain whilst Koscielny is out. I just I think he's too old now to be learning this new system at about 36 years old, whereas Leno, a decade younger, fresh into the team. We've spent a hefty portion of our transfer budget on him. We should get a chance to see him in um, the League Cup game and the Europa League uh, games coming up soon. So if he p- performs well there, then I think he'll be certainly knocking on the door to disperse Petr Cech. But um, yeah, as I say, it's going to take time. His playing out from the back system is going to affect the defence more than any other area of the pitch. So it will take time, but um, it could just be a, a simple case of maybe we'll see some like Mavro panels are holding breakthrough. Maybe it could uh, be something like that to, to, to see the defense look a bit more solid, but I won't count much. chickens just, it's very early days. And all I want to see from master is a clean sheet sooner rather than later. Yeah. <laughs> Don't we all um, talking about Unai Emery's team and, and what he's done so far. We've, we saw him in the last fixture up at Cardiff go with Aubameyang and Lacazette. Now, I've said in the past often that I think they need to play as a front two. I, I, I don't like the idea of, of Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, one of Europe's most lethal centre-forwards, starting from the left-hand side. Does Unai Emery have to find another way of accommodating the two, in your opinion? And, and if so, what would you do? I think it's an interesting one. I mean, it, it, when you put it like that, there's no doubt about it. He is one of the best strikers in Europe at the minute. And he's in his prime years. He's 29 years old. will be turning 30 this season. So to see him shoehorn into the team on the left-hand side is, is a shame. But I think realistically, you have to look at what he offered to the game against Cardiff and the goal he scored coming from that left-hand side as well. Is it really that much of a negative if he can still bang in 20 to 25 goals, but you know, even 30 plus goals this season, if he could do that from the left-hand side, then I, I don't think that's too much of an issue, to be honest, because he's going to be interchanging with Lacazette throughout the whole game. You saw that they did that. The understanding was there. They know when one needs to go wide, when one needs to get into the centre. They're, they're quite clear. They quite clearly know each other's game and they read each other really well, uh, both on and off the pitch, quite clearly. So I, um, I don't think it's a huge issue. But if it was me, because of the lack of width we've already got within the team, and because we are so dependent on our fullbacks as it is, I'd really like to see. Emery implement a 4-1-2-1-2 formation. So have someone like Torreira sitting in a bit deeper or maybe even Granit Xhaka and then have a midfield two of Xhaka, Ramsey, Musa Ozu in his natural number 10 position and then have Lacazette and Aubameyang um, leading the line in the front two. That's probably the most balanced team that I can work out in my mind at the minute. But uh, will that be implemented? I'm not too sure. Um, I'd love to see it happen. And then you've still got the whip through Bellerin and Monreal. They are essentially going to be acting as wingers for us. But it would be unusual. It's not a formation that we particularly see in the Premier League. But I think we've got the capabilities to do it. And I think that would certainly be a formation that would really get me off my seat pre-game. And uh, I, I really hope that we see those two start as a true centre-forward partnership at, uh, at some point. Yep, totally agree. James, um, we take on Newcastle United this coming weekend. We'll be doing a preview podcast on that one with uh, football journalist Harry DeCosimo who is a Newcastle United fan as well. So he'll be able to give us some fantastic insight into Rafa Benitez's side. So do check that out. That will be out on Thursday. What are your hopes for next weekend's game, James? Do you think we can go on some sort of run now and and string a few good results together and climb back up the table and put ourselves in European contention? Um. Probably a bit early to be talking about European contention at this point in the season, but a win away from home against Newcastle would be fantastic for me. Um, that, that's obviously why I want three points away from home once again. It would be three wins on the bounce if we do that, and that would be fantastic for Unai Emery. And what I want as well is a solid defensive performance. Will I get that? Probably not, but it's uh, it's confidence it's confidence boosting to know that we've got players like Aubameyang and Lacazette to um, clear up for our mistakes when we do make them at the back, which is going to happen in this game, I feel. Um, Newcastle is a very intimidating ground to go to. We saw that last season, losing the game there, which was a really horrible match from what I can remember. And if we're going to make Cardiff look like uh, Barcelona at times, then I don't think Newcastle is going to be any easier. They're, they're a good team. I, I think they've put in some good performances this season. They've made um, St. James's Park a really hard place to go to. So I'm I'm not looking forward to this game that much. I mean, obviously, I'm, you know, I'm buzzing for the Premier League to come back, but this isn't 
uh, an easy fixture by any stretch of the imagination. I'd love to see us get a win, but I don't think we should overreact if it's uh, if it's not the if it's not the three points. I know that's really hard to say, but um, and we should be going to places like Newcastle winning. There's no doubt about that. I shouldn't expect anything less. But this is a game where I could. Ah, it really pays me to say I could see us dropping points. Hopefully that won't be the case. I'm 75% certain that we will get a win in this game and we should have the firepower to do it. There's really no excuses to be dropping points away from home. But whilst things are still a little bit in turmoil, um, yeah, you know, it's a really tough one to call, but you know, I'm feeling positive. And if we can get this run of games, um, you know, if we could keep this, this run up, then there's, there's no reason why we shouldn't be Newcastle and three wins on the bounce would be massive for us, especially going into a home game at the Emirates um, uh, next weekend. Yep. Lovely. James, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. Once again, I know most of our listeners hopefully will have gone and checked out your documentaries. Do you want to tell them how they can follow you on YouTube? Because you, you're putting regular videos up on there now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I did one with you not too recently, did I? That was um, I really enjoyed that with you, mate. Um, if you want to follow me on YouTube, it's AFC Game by Game. And uh, on Twitter, it's at jecook 96 Lovely. And make sure you follow James. There's some fantastic videos. I'm not saying the one with me in it is the best, but, you know, check it out. <laughs> uh, lovely. James, thank you so much. And we'll speak again very soon, mate. No worries. Thanks for having me, Harry. Cheers. That was the excellent James Cook. We're going to take a short break. And when we return, we'll be talking to David Hillier. The Chronicles of Aguna 2017-18 is now on sale. The Chronicles of Aguna tells the story of Arsenal's final season through a supporter's eyes, attempts to shed light on some of the season's major talking points and features exclusive interviews with Ray Parler, Kevin Campbell, Tom Watt and Robbie Lyle. Available to order now from Amazon, Waterstones and all major bookstores, The Chronicles of Aguna 2017-18. Order your copy now by clicking the link in the description. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, brought to you by LoserPool.com. Stay tuned until the very end of the episode to find out more about this fantastic game. And for your information, there is a 30% discount on right now, so do check it out ASAP. Joining me on the line is former gunner David Hillier. David, welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna. How are you? I'm very good, thanks, Harry. Hope you're well, and all the Gunas are too. Of course, you know it's it's uh, it's been a bit dull without the international break. Thankfully, you guys put a, a little Legends game on for us uh, over the weekend, which we thoroughly enjoyed. But before we come on to that, David, um, just want to get your thoughts on Unai Emery so far. He's come in, um, obviously got a massive job on his hands. It's never easy to follow on from someone who's had as much impact as Arsene Wenger. Have you seen any progress under Emery? I know it's a bit early to, to make any sort of passing judgments, but based on what you've seen so far, can you understand what he's trying to do and, and are you hopeful it can work? Yeah, I think I think if you're not measuring progress by points, then yeah, I've definitely seen a progress. I've been I've been watching the training quite closely on watching what Arsenal have been putting out and the lads really seem upbeat. There's a lot more tempo. I hear from from sources at the club that um, it's really intense sessions in the morning, every morning, a lot harder than they used to work before. And one or two players are, are having to adjust to that. You know, they've had, I wouldn't say an easy life under Arsene Wenger, but Arsene's style uh, uh, suited a pass and move sort of training. And now they're incorporating this press. I think it, it's a lot harder work. I remember from our days, you know, when you're doing pressing training, and you're, you're training for that high-intensity game, it is a lot harder, so there's an adjustment. But on the pitch, you know, the games have been exciting. I know there's been defensive errors, but on the team moving forward, you know, and the press, it's, it's been an exciting style of play. And I think the players are upbeat about it, and they're all buying into it. So it's going to take time, and I think it's going to take a few more additions to the squad, if I'm honest. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that he's going to need a few more transfer windows to get the type of players that are used to playing his type of football, let's say. My concerns have been the defensive issues, and, and I know you've touched upon it, but for me, it just seems like the, the same problems that we've always had under Wenger just haven't 
been rectified. And I don't know if that's because Emery doesn't quite have the personnel he'd like to, or, you know, I don't know, maybe my expectations were wrong when he came along. I thought that the, the first thing he would do would be to plug some of those holes. And I just feel as though we haven't done that. Would you say I'm maybe being a little bit overly critical given he's only been in charge four weeks or four games? Yeah, I think I think it's it's difficult for him because he's trying to adjust players that have been that brought up in a different sort of regime, and 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 I know from my my people inside the club and and ex players and coaches who have been involved that that Arsene Wenger didn't really do a lot of defensive drilling of the side, and and so the players have got into quite a comfortable mode when it comes to the way they've been defending. Now they've got to adjust, they've got to cover each other. There's a lot more focus on being a unit not not going forward as much from the fullbacks is is key i think i think it showed in the cardiff game hector bellerin definitely checked his game in there so something's been said since since the west ham game although he got two assists in that game i think you know the defensive errors that were were outcomes of his forward play you know, slightly overshadowed by his two assists because that that is a that's a great return for a fullback. I think he got checked, and and then you look at the Cardiff game; he he didn't do it as much. So it, it's happening, but you've got to change the mindset of these players. They've not been used to doing that, and you know it's not easy. When we was under George Graham, we was drilled day in day out as youth team players, as reserve team players, and then as first team players with the same the same attitudes towards defending. Defend first, and then if you get the opportunity, go and play. So he's changing a mindset with these players, and that won't happen overnight. The players can do it. They've proved in spells they can do it. Socrates is definitely that kind of player, and once he, he gets the players around him doing that, I think we'll see them functioning better as a defensive unit. But, you know, I don't think it's been that bad. It's just needs, it just needs tightening up in certain areas and allowing the forwards then to go and play. Yeah, I mean, I would say, looking at it from my point of view, that maybe it's not so much the the back four that are the problem. It's perhaps that we're not finding the balance in midfield to protect them. You know, we know Bellerin's going to get forward. We know that we don't have much else, much more, sorry, natural width in the side. So Bellerin getting up is going to happen. It's essential to us breaking certain teams down, but maybe, you know, a a defensive midfield player needs to slot in and and make sure he plugs the holes. Now, David, you as a midfield player yourself, so I'm really interested to to find out your thoughts on Matteo Guendouzi and how you think he's uh, started his Arsenal career. Well, I I think he's he's started it with such a high level of confidence he's got to be commended for that no you know no one going into the premiership for the first time is easy especially when you're as young as him and that you know he hasn't really got a great deal of first team experience to be going in there and carrying the weight of Arsenal football club on his shoulders as a as a defensive midfielder and he's shown a lot of confidence but i think with confidence sometimes uh, and and youth can there can be a tiny little bit of naivety and he needs to just you know, maybe check one or two parts of his game, but I think he's been fantastic. He's been refreshing. His attitude is spot on. You know, he's he's got a bit of aggression in him. He's fighting for the team. He's, he's not playing for himself. He's playing for the team. That's the most important thing about being a defensive midfielder or even a defender. You play in order to let those other players who are creative players and, and are going to score the goals, you play to let them get their game on. And that's what I always did. I played for the likes of for, for the likes of Ian Wright, for the likes of Anders Limpa, for, for for the likes of the forwards, Kevin Campbell, to, to be able to go and play their game. So I was happy to sit in, fill holes, block things, just so that they could go and score the goals. And I think he's got that attitude. Um, and I think it will only it'll only get better as as he gets more experience in the side. Yeah. David, what would you say is the ideal midfield pairing? Looking at looking at what Unai Emery has available to him now, you know he, he obviously likes to play two midfield players in front of the defence. That little pivot. Who would you go for though? Because there's been much debate about this. It's a debate we've had on the show numerous times. It's something we've been dis- debating on Love Sport Radio, on the A Little Bit Arsenal show. W- what would you? Who would be your two? Who would you pick? Well, it'd be Torreira and Guendouzi. It'd have to be because I think Torreira, he's got a little bit more experience. He's he's so mobile, he's quick, he's got low centre of gravity. He can, he, in it, but also he knows 
what he's supposed to do first. He's disciplined first. He sits in front of the back four good. We saw him when he's come on and he's against Cardiff even. He filled those little holes at fullback, which did allow Hector to get on forward at the end of the game, towards towards the end period. And he settled in there. He made a couple of little lovely turns. He drew the fouls. He, he was able to play that pass that, that breaks the other team down, the forward pass, and bring bring that sort of number 10 role into the game. And then you've got Guendouzi alongside of him, who's who's going to graft, who's going to go side to side, who's going to and, and who's going to probably take a bit of instruction as well because he's young. He'll listen to the players around him. I think sometimes, and it's no disrespect to Granite, I think maybe he's he's got to a level now and an age when it's difficult for him to take instruction for from younger players. And with Torreira probably trying to direct him, I don't know if that would really work. And I, I don't know if he's got the ability to get that ball. And, and make that turn in front of the central defenders and play that forward pass. Sometimes he just goes back to the fullback and puts them under pressure again. So for me, it'd have to be it'd have to be Guendouzi and Torreira. Okay, interesting. That's a really interesting selection, um, David. Sp- speaking to Arsenal fans now, what would you say is a realistic expectation for this season? Because as Arsenal fans, we've been accused by other football fans over the last few years of having unrealistic expectations of Arsene Wenger. Now Unai Emery's come in, what would you expect to see Arsenal achieve this season? What would be a good season for you? Well, I mean, that's a difficult question because I'm, I'm always, I'm an optimist and the cup's always half full for me, but realistically, I think an automatic Champions League spot would be a great achievement. And I think that's, that, that that's right at the top end. I'm thinking maybe fifth or sixth with a with a good run in the Europa, possibly getting to the final because because I think um, Unai has got the ability to make his players produce, and I think he won't he won't just play young kids in 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 cups and that he'll play teams to win, regardless of um, of, of you know the, the the rotation of the squad and that. I think he'll play play sides that he wants to win every game. Um, I think a cup is definitely a realistic opportunity. And, uh, yeah, as I said, I'd I'd be happy with fifth or sixth in the league at this stage. But that depends who he gets. If he gets someone in this, you know, a bit tasty in in January and can give us that push towards the end of the season and give the side a lift, maybe maybe even two or three players, then, yeah, you could could be chasing one of those Champions League spots. But the way the other teams have started and, you know, the growth that they've had, you look at Liverpool's growth, City is still there. You know, I, I think, you know, those fellas down the road, they're going to be a tough um, nut to crack this season. So it's, it's going to be tough. But, you know, I, I just want to see good football and I want to see progress. Yeah, that's that's the key thing for me, progress. And whether that means finishing fifth instead of sixth, that's that's fine by me. It's his first season. I'd be, I wouldn't be happy with it, but... I'd accept it, and I'd say that's that's realistic, I suppose. Um, David, you also took part in the Legends game this weekend, just gone. Um, what an honour it must be to go back to the club and, and line up for a Legends team. How'd, describe the feeling, you know, going back and doing what you love after after so long. Uh, unbelievable. I mean, I'm, I'm 50 next year. So the last time I played for the club, I was, I was 26, I think, 26, 27. And, you know, that's half a lifetime away. Um, and someone actually said to me on the, on the day, what's, you know, what, what are the three best things that have come out of this? And I said, being able to go on the Emirates and kick a ball around, being able to play with that calibre of player and, and, you know, in front of those cr- that crowd in that stadium. And the third thing was to experience football as, as the players do now, because we had... I had my family come down. We travelled on the first team bus, all of us. Oh wow! We 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 was put up in an absolutely top notch hotel the night before the game. Um, we was looked after from from the morning till the to the evening, and it was just a such a, an experience for everyone in my family to have as well. These players have it every week, week in week out, and it's just unbelievable. And just to have it once was phenomenal so those three things but then when I got on the pitch different story mate I had to I had to get involved a bit <laughs> um, you know I can't change my game and I, I was I was quite happy with what I did at right back I had 40 odd minutes and 
covered a little bit of ground and I, I trained hard for that as well I did eight weeks training for that game um, so I put the effort in for the charities and that. I didn't want to let anybody down like none of the guys do and um, it was just a fantastic experience great stuff great stuff David thank you so much for joining me um, do you want to let our listeners know how they can follow you on social media uh, yeah I'm I'm really only on Twitter I have got a, a little a Facebook page and it's just Dave Hillier um, but uh it's at Dave Hillier on Twitter with two R's. So um, if you want to join in any of the um, rants I'll get involved in, <laughs> which I do regularly um, on, on there because I'm passionate and I'm also, I'm a sucker for an argument. So, you know, if, <laughs> you, and me if, both. if you want one, just, just hook me up, mate. I'm, I'm always there. You and me both. And, and David, sorry, just before I let you go, I, I saw a, a tweet today and I, I completely agreed there was a guy on AFTV speaking about Anders Limpar and I just thought that's completely disrespectful out of all that and you would know from first hand how good a player was Anders Limpar well you know what I spoke to Anders today he didn't know nothing about it and he really don't he couldn't give two hoots about it and and it's not about how good a player Anders was it's nothing to do with that it's at, it, at the end of the day he was an Arsenal player whether it was Anders Limpar or Colin Pates or or Chris White, or me, or Stevie Morrow, or John Jensen, or any of them players that, that weren't held up as, as trophy players, as goal scorers, as legends and all that. Whatever one it was, it would be the same feeling for me. It's one of my teammates, an ex-player that pulled on that shirt with, with passion and love. And I know the fans are passionate, and I know they're supposed to be a platform for them to say their say their thing and I understand that's that's what AFTV media is about. I to, I totally get that and there's no one you know it, it's a it's a it's a world of opinions out there and everyone's entitled to them. But there's a choice on who they actually show on there. And for me, they don't need to show the ones at the bottom of the pile who talk shit. And I'm gonna Agreed. say it. They don't need to show them ones because it they don't mean nothing. Someone someone tweeted back to me because I mentioned that it's a it's a money generator, and I did that out of probably a lack of knowledge about what it is. And and you know what, from the from all the tweets and all the retweets of it, they probably earn like someone quoted to me, they earn the price of a ticket out of that. So that ain't gonna feed them, right? That ain't gonna feed them if they got fifty quid out of it. So why do it? Yeah, and that's my. That's right. It's not relevant. It's it's really got nothing to do with the club. And someone said, this guy's a regular there. You know, he's always doing something. So they felt they need to. Why? Why? He, he don't know what he's talking about. He loves the club in his own way. But if you're trying to put something out there as a platform for people to actually debate and have a decent conversation about and, and you know, put their two sides across, then I'm all up for it. The, the, the Wenger out campaign, I, was, I wasn't, I'm a Wenger in man. I was all the way. But I understand that, that things weren't going right and people needed to talk about it. But seriously, Anders Limpar scraping the bottom of the barrel? Are you having a tin bath, mate? This is like not <laughs> this is not like what we wanna hear on social media. There's better ways to earn your pennies. And um but but I'm I'm coming from a limited knowledge of their their show. They could well put out a hundred things that are good and that might just have been a bit of a crap one, but why waste your time on crap ones? That's, That's what I'm yeah. saying. I completely agree. And and my feelings on AFTV have been known for a while. You know, it started off as a fantastic concept. I, I think it was a brilliant idea. It's obviously taken off fantastic, great. But there's got to be a point where, you know, this is becoming a, a massive beast now. This is influencing Arsenal fans all over the world. And it might not influence me or you, but there are Arsenal fans who don't get to go to games often because they're abroad or whatever reason. And they base their match day experience on what they watch on AFTV. And there's got to be a point where, like you basically said, that the shit needs to be filtered out. And and putting shit like that on there, just it doesn't do anything apart from generate clicks, like you said. And, and you know, at some point, it's got to be sorted out because the club is, is looking stupid as a result of it. And I think the club know that. Otherwise, they wouldn't have asked them to change the name. Mm. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. If, from my opinion, I mean, I, I haven't seen a lot of it, so you know what I mean. I did say I'm coming from a limited knowledge of all the the stuff they output. I've probably seen four or five 
um, things that have been almost turned into gifts, like um, <laughs> like that bloke who says you got no fans, you got no yeah, club, yeah. you got it, it like that, and 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 I just see them as that. I don't see all the other stuff, and I don't listen to all the other stuff to be honest. Um, maybe the club have been affected. I don't know. I, I think the club's more just protecting their brand more than bit feeling um, sort of intimidated or under threat from from them because. Because they are allowed to do that, and the fact that out there is there is a market, and you know I don't want to say that any Arsenal fan is not very clever or don't know what they're talking about. But if these people are watching that kind of stuff week in week out, and it is as bad as what we saw the the, the video yesterday, what came out or whatever, if it is that bad, then it just shows that really they're quite needy people, and and haven't got much of an understanding anyway. It's, and, I, and I quoted it. It's like people who watch Jeremy Kyle. I don't get it. I don't get why you want to see people with no teeth talking about sleeping with their sister and their brother and, and this, that and the other and then having five kids. Because half them people, I can't believe they even get in bed with each other. So, or anyone gets in bed with them, what they look like. So, you know, for me, it's just, it's an unbelievable, but it's a market. And um, I, d- I don't know anyone in the, in there personally. I don't know Robbie personally or or any of them. I've met Lee. I've met Lee Judges. And do you know what? It was a lovely bloke when I met him at the stadium. I didn't even know he had anything to do with Arsenal TV when I met him. That that and I met him as a so I met him as a normal person. Yeah. He was with his with his wife. Lovely lovely people. They said hello to me. He said I remember when you was playing. Blah blah blah. And we have a bit of banter and. And that's that's as far as I'll go with him. I don't know anything more about him. And for me, he's okay. I've got no problem with him. I've got no problem with Robbie. I don't know him as a person. Um, people say he's a nice guy. People say he's a Luton fan. Well, I don't really... It don't bother me. It, it really don't bother me. All that bothers me is when I see little bits of shit with someone talking crap about one of my mates that pulled on a shirt that meant a lot to pull on that shirt. And they don't know what they're talking about. And And... They have a choice in who they put on there. That's all I'll say. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And uh, and I work with Lee Judges as well on the same old Arsenal podcast. Lee's fantastic, brilliant guy. Um, and I know I, I've even spoken to Robbie. I've interviewed Robbie before for my book last year. And Robbie's a lovely guy as well. But yeah, I, I, it's, it's totally right. There, there needs to be a point where they're filtering what is going out. Because, yeah. you know, more more and more each week, people are sort of turning against it. And it's a shame because it's taken a lot of hard work to build that up to where it is. And to ruin yeah. a brand by putting shit on it, basically, it is a shame. Mm. So it, it's, it's, and right I mean, that it's called up. When, when sometimes I'm, I, I put on my tweets as well, I've got, I've got to say it, I put on like a pound note sign and all that. I've never been a man that's been driven by money or material things or anything, right? So I can truly say that from the bottom of my heart. Um, I, I, I've known what it's like to have stuff and lost stuff, but I've always lived a good life. So I don't, I don't want for anything. So money's not an issue to me. Um, and when I say it's for the pound note, I don't mean it's for the pound note in their pocket for them to go out. And I don't care what they earn a year. I don't care what they get out of it. I just think that it's, it's, it's a little bit of a sellout to do that to, to, to players and to the club. It's a little bit of a letdown at them points, at them times that they do it. And and I mentioned the pound because it's an easy target, really. Um, but it probably don't make them that much as, as all the good stuff that they kind of do, like, like you said. And, and at the end of the day, if they ruin their brand from it, then then it's their fault. But I, I can't see that happening because I think there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of Muppets out there that want to watch that shit, to be honest with you. And it makes money, you know. We saw two YouTubers have a fight on on last week in a boxing ring, and it generated as much as a as some of some boxers that that work all their life for the big fight for, you know. And and it's ridiculous, but that's the world we're living in. And it's and you know and that, and it's aimed at a certain group of people, and then people are out there. Yeah. Totally agree. David, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you this evening. Thank you so much for coming on, and we hope we can speak to you again in the near future. Yeah, definitely, Eric, mate. I'm up for that, mate. No worries. And um, make sure you, uh, like I said, copy me in on the, on, the, on the link, and I'll tweet it out to all my, all my people, and I'll be listening in tomorrow morning. Will do. Will do, mate. Thank you very much. No worries, mate. Pleasure. Pleasure. 
That was former Gunners midfielder David Hillier joining me. Don't forget to check him out on social media. Give him a follow. And of course, follow us if you don't already at Chronicles underscore AFC. Make sure you subscribe. And uh, if you prefer, you can listen to this podcast on Acast, iTunes, FNX, YouTube, TuneIn. I think that covers everything. We'll be back this Thursday with football journalist and Newcastle United fan Harry De Cosimo to look ahead to our clash with the Toon Army this coming weekend. Until then, goodbye. Meet our hero. He's a smart guy who loves sports and loves outwitting other people. Our hero needs to show the world his mastery of the game. Our hero does this by playing games at loser pool. Our hero is you. Loserpool has two games. In the namesake, the games of an entire season are grouped together into weeks or rounds. After paying an entry fee, you choose one team to lose that week or round. If you're correct, you earn the right to repeat the process in the next round. But the catch is that you cannot choose a team a second time until all the teams have been chosen by you once. If you're knocked out early, you may re-enter the same pool by paying a penalty to make it fair for the other players. Or you may wait until the next pool starts in a few weeks. Razor Pool is similar to Loser Pool in that the games of an entire season are grouped together. But in this case, you pay the entry fee and predict the outcome of all the games in that week or round. You will be ranked against all other players according to your accuracy. And at the end of each round, a predetermined percentage of players will be eliminated. There is no option to buy back into a pool if you are eliminated, (laughs) and so you will have to wait until the next pool starts to play again. In both games, the prize money grows very rapidly. The pool is allocated to the last man standing, or to add a little drama, to a small surviving group if they vote according to predetermined rules. Loser Pool is about community, friendship, fun and rivalry. Discuss and debate the games and events of the week with players from around the world. Invite your friends and co-workers into your own sub-pools and see who can outsmart the group and earn bragging rights. This is your moment. Create an account. Show your sports genius. Be the hero.